Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 116. I look back on my life, and it's 95% running around trying to raise money to make movies, and 5% actually making them. It's no way to live. Orson Welles. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, Uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects, and you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering The Tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for The Tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. So guys, today's episode, I wanted to go back a bit and, and talk about a time, a, a, a much simpler time, a, a lovely time called the 90s, where a lot of uh, indie film guys got their start. And uh, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the lessons we can learn from a lot of these guys who started uh, their careers back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and what they were able to do and how they did it. And I, I've studied them over the course of my career and just started finding similar themes and similar things that each of these guys did to kind of get out there to get a career started. So I wanted to go over um, go over individual filmmakers as well as movies and concepts as well. And I hope you guys get a little something out of it because I, I've been I've been getting contacted a lot by filmmakers who, you know, are trying to get their first movies made and 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 I see they, they tell me like, oh I'm gonna do this kind of movie and this kind of movie and it's gonna cost X amount of dollars and 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 I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, my God, you know, the chances of you actually making any money back is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, and I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a helping hand, if I can, with this episode. So first and foremost, guys, when you're going to go into making a movie, your first feature film, do it as cheaply as humanly possible. Dirt cheap. Okay, I, I, I mean, the bare minimum of what you can do to get your movie finished and made. Because a lot of filmmakers will show up and go, look, I've got $200,000 for my first movie. I'm like, well, if you have $200,000 for your first movie, you better pick a genre that's really marketable. You probably better pick a couple stars that are going to be in, involved so you can at least get some basic sales off of that. And if you don't do that, you're going to be destined for failure because even Sundance winners and big, big, you know, big Sundance, Tribeca, South by Southwest, full blown winners and audience winners and best of shows, you know, for you to get the $200,000 back on a, let's call it a drama or a comedy or a dramedy um, or something that's not genre based extremely extremely difficult and i and i think a lot of filmmakers 
make that big mistake right up front. And when they finally do do that and they completely fall on their face, they're discouraged and never make another movie again. And I don't want to see that happen to you guys. So try to make your movie as cheap as possible. And, you know, you could take um, Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, Rich, uh, Richard Linkletter, uh, Spike Lee, uh, all of these guys, all their first movies were very inexpensive. Uh, but obviously the famous one, which is Robert Rodriguez at $7,000, uh, Kevin Smith at thirty or $27,000 he put on his credit cards, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll use this as Meg as an example. I'll use myself. You know, We made the movie for under $25 million. Uh, we'll release the final budget once the audit is done. <laughs> but we made the movie at a place where we feel comfortable that we can recoup our initial investment. Now, that could be half a million dollars. Uh, that could be $5,000. Not saying Meg in general, but just a general statement. Because if you have a certain star or a certain genre or a certain thing and a half a million dollars and you know you can pre-sell or sell uh, certain territories and things like that, half a million dollars makes a lot of sense. If you know you're going to probably get 1.5 back for it. But if you're going in with a drama with no stars at a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar budget, um, good luck. It's uh, you'd be one of the few, and when I say few, I can count them on my hands. If I could even think of movies that blew out of the water uh, at that kind of uh, budget range when they're first starting out. But what you need to do is embrace your limitations. Do what you can do very well. So again, I'll use Meg as an example. You know, my limitations, which were limitations I set on myself, I knew what I had. I knew what kind of cast I can get. I knew what kind of locations I could get. I knew what camera I can afford that I could have complete control over as opposed to getting a free Alexa, which would have brought all sorts of, you know, headaches, uh, financial headaches, as well as technical and logistical headaches for this kind of movie. And I just, I just fell right into what I had access to, you know. I'm, I'll go back to Mariachi. You know, Robert had access to a full Mexican town. So he made a movie about a full Mexican town. Kevin Smith had access to a, 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 um, a convenience store. And he made a movie about a convenience store. Richard Linkletter made a movie called Slacker. What did he have access to? Austin. Austin back in the 90s, which is not the cool hip Austin that it is today. Um, he just made a movie about his backyard. And that's another thing you guys have to understand. You should make a movie that is close to you, that is your experience, your perspective on something. There's been a lot of convenience stores and movies in the history of film, but no one has ever done it quite like Kevin Smith. It was his perspective, his rawness of what it's really like to be a clerk. And that was his that was his truth. Same thing goes for a go uh, to Richard Linkletter and Slash and uh, Slacker. He wanted to show what these people and this town was like from his perspective, his voice. And if you start going back and watching all of the first movies of of a lot of these great directors, they're gonna they're gonna a lot of them are gonna be very close to home. They're gonna be cl- you know I'm sure there's an there's the occasional you know, oddball out like the following, you know, by Chris Nolan. Um, but it was still something that he had, ac- he, he used what he had access to, which was a 16 millimeter camera. And he shot it on weekends for a year, you know, so he, he definitely embraced his limitations and tried to make the best thing he could with the limited tools and, ex- and experience and locations and, and everything he had. But a lot of these other people who really kind of break through they are telling a story that's very true to who they are and where they come from. And that unique voice is what people are looking for. They're not looking for another. Like if I went out right now and made Clerks, no one wants to see that movie. And that's what happened with like when Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs came out. How many ripoffs of Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction came out after that? I mean, it was ridiculous how many try to be hip, you know, hip kind of movies came out. But it wasn't authentic, and audiences can smell that. And when you find something authentic, something with some heart, something that that rings true, that's when you break out, man. So that's why Clerks, um, my big fat Greek wedding, you know, for you know, which was one of the biggest independent films of all time. Sure, it wasn't done on a little little low budget, but it wasn't a studio movie by any stretch. That movie made two, three hundred million dollars. Why? Because Nina, the the writer, 
wrote from her heart, from her experience. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. From her voice, no one had ever done a movie like that before. But then, of course, everyone could relate to that movie because of the story and how she was able to write it. But again, it came from her life experience. She's Gotta Have It, Spike Lee's first movie, was all about his experience in New York, what it was like to be a black woman in New York in the late 80s. And that whole experience, something that no one had ever seen on screen before. So Boys in the Hood, another one, John Singleton's first movie, is a masterpiece. And it, what, it, it, it completely rings true to the experience he saw, that he grew up with. And no one had really talked about it. You know, they did Colors, you know, that, um, that movie by uh, Dennis Hopper and Sean Penn about the gangs in you know south l and you know south central and all those areas but no one was really and it was kind of very hollywoody as opposed to boys in the hood then when you watch boys in the hood you will tear up you will go holy crap it was so powerful it was like an atom bomb going off in cinema when that came out you know from a 23 year old why because he was authentic to who he was and his experience and that's what i want you guys to kind of look for when trying to make your first movie find something that's authentic to you that only you could tell that story and mind you you like oh well you know i work in a cl- in, a, in a video store well you know oh, no, nobody works in a video store anymore but um you work at a convenience store oh clerks has already been done well maybe you could tell it in a different way from your experience from your place where it maybe has not been told in that way you know there's been a lot of movie there's been a lot of action movies in the in the world, but it all depends on the kind of perspective you put on it, and what your voice is, what your your message, your theme is. And I think as when you're first starting out, it's the easiest thing to do with a feature. You know, I've done when my my first shorts were very ambitious, very action packed, very true. But I'll be honest with you, looking back at some of those movies, I'm like, you know what? There's there's just something missing for me as as an artist and being critical of my own work. I'll go back and go, you know what, there's something missing there. Maybe I was on to something, maybe I wasn't, I don't know. But Meg, for for what better or worse, I really love This Is Meg because it's a really authentic view of what I was seeing um, through the eyes of Jilly, you know, and what she was going through as an actress in L.A. And I had been very close to that world. And we've all seen movies about actresses and actors trying to make it in Hollywood, but I don't think anyone's seen one like this before because it's a very unique perspective, a very uh, unique, authentic view of this world. So that's what I was trying to do, and I did it again on a budget that I feel comfortable I can get a return on. So look around you and find out what you have access to, and then you start building your story around that. That's exactly what we did with This Is Meg. We started looking and taking inventory of everything we had, so I'm like, all right, we have an edit suite. There's, there's going to be a scene with an edit suite in it because it has good production value. It's the edit suite that we edited the movie in. You know, we have houses. All right, you have your house, my house. How many rooms can we do? How many things we could do? Great. We have a car. We have these cars. Great. I have some friends with houses. Great. Uh, and then I have all these actor friends of mine. Great. That's a resource. Let's use that. Okay. And then I have all this. Stuff. I bring all my camera gear. Great. I have all the. And then that's how we were able to construct the story of This Is Meg, within the limitations of what we had access to. And Clerks did it, Mariachi did it, Slackers did it. And a lot of people will go, well, how about like District 9, you know, Neil Camp's uh, great little short that got him his first feature. Now, I'm going to argue with you, and how about Paranormal Activity? Okay, great. So I'll argue with you that those two movies were not, quote unquote, from, you know, like a a little you know personal movie. But if you look at District 9, what did it do? Neil set the movie in South Africa. An alien invasion kind of movie in South Africa. I've never seen that before, have you? No. Now, would have that movie still had the same impact if it was set in Chicago or New York or L.A.? I don't know. I personally don't think so. I think one of the charms of that movie is because it's set in South Africa. And why is it set in South Africa? Because guess what? Neil's South African. And he felt like he wanted to put something from his experience. So he melted his experience 
with a really cool sci-fi story. Now, that was the other thing I'm saying. The kind of stories I'm talking about are either going to be dramas, uh, comedies, dramedies, uh, even actions. Uh, but in sci-fi, if you look at a, Sun, a Sundance-winning movie called Sleep Dealer by Alex Rivera, that's a movie about uh, basically immigration. And uh, But he threw a sci-fi twist in it. He's a Mexican a filmmaker, and he decided to throw his experience as you know day laborers, and not his experience, but the story of day laborers. But he threw it in with an insane sci-fi twist to it, and again he just twisted it, but used his original and his authentic experience to tell that story, and it's his voice, and that's what I'll, the other thing I'm going to tell you guys. I'll argue that District Nine Sleep Dealer. Uh, paranormal activity those also are genre movies so genre kind of is different than what i'm talking about the dramedies the comedies the even the actions but action sci-fi horror those those are genre um genres and because of those those are much easier to sell and don't need uh, as much of as an authentic voice as a drama or comedy does now look at district nine District 9 had a very authentic voice mixed in with a sci-fi movie, and it was a huge hit. So he mixed genre with authentic voice, and that's something that you guys could do as well. Genres are going to be a much genre films are going to be a lot easier to sell, a lot easier to get out there, and it all depends on what you want to do with your filmmaking career. If you want to go down the festival circuits, you want to make personal films, you want to make big blockbusters, I you know, it's up to you. Robert Rodriguez made Mariachi, which was an action movie, which is a genre movie, but was very authentic to his voice, which is in his backyard, which is a Mexican town. He's a Mexican-American uh, filmmaker, and he was using his authentic voice, his experience, to make his genre movie. So to review a little bit of what we just talked about, make your first movie as dirt cheap as possible. The cheaper, the better. Because if you're able to make a movie for 15 grand, you should, if you know even remotely what you're doing, make yourself 30 grand off of that. And then the next one you can make will cost 30 grand. And then off that 30 grand, maybe you can make 50 or 60 grand off of that. And then you could start growing and growing and growing. And then you can start jumping budgets once you start figuring the process out a little bit. But trying to jump in right away with a huge budget, when I say huge budget, $100,000 for someone who's never directed a day in their life is a lot. $200,000, that's a lot of fucking money. Excuse my language. And I know a lot of filmmakers just want to like, oh, I am got my big budget. I'm going to use all these tools and stuff like that. Don't be idiots. Try to do something small first. If you can, if you can execute something on a smaller scale, tell a good story on a twenty thousand dollar budget, on a fifteen thousand dollar budget, on a ten thousand dollar budget, then you have a much, much better chance of telling a good story and making it look good when you have a bigger budget. There's a lot of things that you don't think about when working on a bigger budget, but if you do something small, that might work better. And I'll use myself again with Meg as an example. You know, we raised a good amount of money to make the movie, but it was a number that we felt very comfortable with. I could have easily tripled it, quadrupled that kind of budget uh, and made a much bigger movie because I have 20 years of experience under my belt. I've directed four or $500,000 music videos and commercials and things like that in my career, but I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to strip it down to the bare bones and like, look, this is about story. Let's see if I can tell a story that I'm proud of before I start jumping into the next big project. Don't be in such a rush to jump into these bigger budgets, guys, all right? Learn from the lessons of Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, Spike Lee, uh, all these guys that started, uh, Richard Linkletter, that started out with smaller, smaller budgets telling very personal stories because that's what will take you to the next level and the next level and the next level after that. And again, there always are those people who who are the exception. Uh, but generally speaking, I don't know of any examples of people who who made a drama or a comedy or a dramedy uh, at a very you know robust budget with no stars or anything like that involved, and was able to be very successful with it. I know of many people who did genre movies, horror movies, action movies. I mean, Eli Roth, Peter Jackson. Um, all these kind of guys, 
they did genre movies. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And uh, and that's how they got noticed and how that, how they broke out and started their career. I mean, we can go all the way back to Martin Scorsese's first films, Who's That Knocking, which was completely from his experience. All his short films, most of his early short films, were based around his experience, which is his experience in the streets of New York in the 60s and 70s, growing up, seeing the mobster, seeing the thing. That was his authentic voice. And that voice he's carried on throughout his career, jumping in and out from that. His next movie is another gangster movie because he's so good at it because he understands that world so well. But that's his authentic voice from where Martin Scorsese came from. Then he did Mean Streets. Then he starts jumping into something like Taxi Driver. Then he jumps into Raging Bull and these other movies that aren't his personal stories anymore, but his personal stories are what got him to the next level. And that's what I'm trying to tell you guys you should look at. And I know a lot of you going, well, Alex, I don't have a personal story. I live in Podunk, wherever. Not a lot of stuff happens here. I'm like, perfect. That's exactly where your story is. What if something happens in that little town with those characters, those people that you know so well that you might have never seen on screen before? Again, Slacker, no one had ever seen that world before. You know, Boys in the Hood, no one had ever seen that kind of world before. Clerks, no one had ever seen his take on that world before. Same thing with Mariachi. So guys, I hope you you learned something out of this podcast and I hope you take some of the advice I've given you out here. Hopefully it makes sense to you and will help you along your your journey uh, as filmmakers as an and as artists and I hope you guys can launch successful careers as filmmakers, which is what we're all trying to do. We're all trying to do that. We're all trying to make a living doing what we love to do. And hopefully we can look at others who have done it and taken their careers to levels that we could only dream of. So I'm going to put links to all of the movies that I've talked about in this episode in our show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 116. There will also be a great little video, about 10-minute video, on lessons you can learn from filmmakers in the 90s when you're making your first feature film. Uh, so definitely check that out, guys. And as always, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave me a good review on iTunes. It really helps me out a lot, guys. And I want to get this out to as many people as humanly possible. And also, I've got a bunch of great stuff coming up at the Syndicate. We're going to be up, uh, uploading a ton of new courses as well. So check that out as well, IndieFilmSyndicate.com. And finally, guys, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to ask me something. So I'm going to start creating a little uh, a little section either I'm going to do it in a, in, a, in its own podcast or I'm going to uh, do it at the end of podcast depending on how many questions I get but I want you guys to send me some questions if you have a question that you're just dying to know and you really wish you could ask uh, and get an answer to and you think I can possibly answer it for you email me at ifh submissions at gmail.com that's ifh submissions at gmail.com and that will uh, just write me a question going, hey, uh, this question and this question. And I'll do a, a podcast episode answering those questions alone. And hopefully that will help you guys a bit. So you could either do it. Uh, that will probably be the best way to get a hold of me with it. So ifhsubmissions.com. So keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 